If you could give one advice to parents that are having kids between the zero and seven, what would that be? Every positive thing you can think of, how smart they are, how beautiful they are, how powerful they are, how they're great creators, how they can do anything. Why? Because if they become the subconscious programs and that child runs 95% of its life from what? The super positive program, I'm smart, I'm intelligent, I'm powerful, I'm a creator, I can create what I want. I said, then guess what? Their life will be an expression of all the positive things you said. Hello everyone, it's Özlem Özkan, your host for the Bridging Podcast. Today I am together with a guest that I am following for years, Dr. Bruce Lipton. Bruce Lipton is a stem cell biologist, author of the books, The Biology of Belief and The Honeymoon Effect. In his book, he writes about how our beliefs control our health, genetics, and the character of our lives. He's an internationally recognized leader in bridging science and spirits. And he has been a guest speaker on many TV shows, YouTube channels, and podcasts, as well as keynote presenter for national and international conferences. Bruce Lipton, welcome to the Bridging Podcast once more. I'm so, so happy that you're here. I'm a big fan of you. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much for offering this wonderful audience. And I say, why is that important? Because your audience are the people that are thinking. And we need a lot of new thinking coming on right now because the world is in a very strange place. Whether you are uh, surfing the web or watching the news or even looking out your window, the world is in a state of chaos. Now, the reason why this is very important, uh, and I just want to bring it up to give us an attitude about it, and that is this. Today, if we want to just keep the world running the way it is today, keep civilization working just the way it is today, it takes 1.6 planet Earths to provide for the civilization. Well, clearly, there's a problem. We don't have an extra 0.6 planet Earth which says very simply, humans are living beyond the resources of the planet, mm -hmm. that we can't do this anymore, and that nature is giving us a wake-up call. Nature is saying, either you change your civilization or you go extinct. Now, you say, well, what do you mean? I say, well, scientists in the U.S. at NASA have recognized that within two decades, within 20 years, there will be an irreversible, I want to emphasize, irreversible collapse of our civilization. Within we, 20 years. It, within 20 years. Now, why is this significant for us? It says, well, we know we can't keep living like this. So I said, what do you think we have to do? And I go, it's the culture and the civilization that we live by today that is causing the problem. So I said, what can you do about it? I say, can't fix this one. This is the civilization you're in is the problem. So I say, then what's the way out? And the answer is just what's happening. There's a breakdown of the current civilization because we can't live this way. But simultaneously, the building up of a new civilization. The new civilization uh, is really right now um, primarily populated with people called cultural creatives. Well, if you're watching this program, you fit the definition of a cultural creative. A cultural creative is looking for answers that are not in the box, but are outside the box. Mm. And that together, the cultural creatives are the foundation of the new civilization. So I just want people to know there's two choices here. One, you could hold on to the old one that's falling down. I go, don't, don't do that. <laughs> it's falling down. It will take you down with it. Or you can build a new one and participate in building the new one. I go, that's the choice. And the idea about it is this. If you hold on to the one that's falling down, uh, the, the system and the stresses, well, you'll get sick. And people, that's why the healthcare crisis is getting worse every day because it's the stress that is killing us. If you hold on to the old system, 
that's going to be very stressful because it's falling apart right in front of your face. Yeah. To avoid the stress, you come out and with Oslam and the people she talks with on the program and listening to these podcasts, you get to get another vision of how to move into the future. And I'll give you a very simple fact. We're not just going to survive. We will thrive into mm. the future. So that's build nice. A, a build a civilization that is going to be in total harmony with the planet. But you have to let go of the old one first. So um, this is why I have uh, deepest appreciation to be here with you on this program because there's all kinds of information mm -hmm. about how you can go from today's world into the future world where we're going to actually have a great life. And uh, being on this program is an honor for me because it gives me an opportunity to talk to you, cultural creatives. Yeah, I was going to say that cultural creatives, listen up, we are going out of the box. So we're going to thrive here. So that was very nice. Thank you, Bruce. So, you know, Bruce, I would like to actually start with a very short story about my upbringing. Yes. So I was born and raised in the Netherlands. You know, my parents are Turkish and uh, my grandparents, uh, both sides, were both illiterate. And my parents were primary educated. So when they came to the Netherlands, their one goal was my siblings and I, we had to go to school and study. So that was really the biggest aim. But while growing up, they also taught us their values of how they were raised. And so we were praying a lot. We were like, for example, like we, we grew up religious, but also like a lot in pray. Like if you want something, you have to pray for it. You have to feel as if you already have it and it will be always given. That, that's what I said. And I remember I was praying every night before sleeping when I was actually in the theta brainwave. So then I go to school, high school, university. I do my bachelor education, master in science, in behavioral sciences. So when I get into the science, the science part where I was in, I had never really learned about that our thoughts or beliefs create our real reality. But what I learned about is if something is not science-based, it's not true. So then I became ambivalent between the praying part of Islam, like asking for what you want and believing in it and feeling it as it is. And it's not proven, so should I believe in it? I got really ambivalent in my early 20s. Then the end of my 20s, I started reading a lot of personal growth book. I started attending courses. I went to retreats about awareness and I started knowing about you, the biology of belief, your, first, your book that you wrote. And uh, there I really felt like there is someone, one person here that is really explaining the science between the correlation between your belief and the life you create. So based on this, my first question is how do you prove scientifically that your thoughts create your life? <laughs> well, the easy part for me is I don't have to prove it. The most truthful, the most valid of all the sciences on this planet is quantum physics. Now, most people have heard of quantum physics, but have no real understanding of what is quantum physics. So this is important because you're going to have to change how you look at the world because quantum physics is a revolution of how we see the world. The physics that we all grew up with is called classical physics or Newtonian physics. That's conventional. And that separated our universe into things made out of matter and things made out of energy. So it said there are two different realms or two different ways the universe is divided, matter and energy. They also said that matter affects matter, energy affects energy, but matter and energy don't, don't interact. I go, well, this is unfortunate because, as you said, when you were talking about praying, praying is generating energy. <laughs> it's a thought. It's a transmission, okay? The, the important understanding is this, is that um, that science of separation separated thinking, which is energy, from body, which is physical, and this led us into, if you want to work with a body, you have to use something physical, pharmaceutical drugs. <laughs> That's what they sell you. Okay, comes 1927 and a new physics. And I go, what is it based on? I say, well, they were taking the atom apart, atom or particles or, you know, pieces of matter. 
Mm-hmm. And they were taking it apart, and then they found that the atom had like a little solar system with a nucleus with protons and neutrons and electrons running around. And then they said, well, those are smaller particles. And then they said, well, what are they made out of? And then they found those smaller particles called quarks. And they go, okay, now what? What are they made out of? And that's when the world changed. It changed because quarks are not made out of physical things. Quarks are made out of energy. Energy is what builds an atom. Atom is an expression of energy. The point about quantum physics is there is no separation of matter and energy. It's all energy. And I go, so what does that mean? I say, and here's a quote uh, from Albert Einstein. Very important. It says, the the field, which is the energy in which we are living, the field is the sole governing agency of matter. This is quantum physics. I say, what does that mean? The field is the energy, and it's what shapes matter. And I go, so why is that important? I go, that's where thought comes in. That's where thinking is involved. Thinking generates a field, and the field, the energy of the thoughts, shape the reality. So the conclusion of physics in 1927, that's Mm -hmm. 100 years ago, really, from Max Planck, one of the founding fathers of quantum physics, and this is the quote in the most valid science, consciousness is creating our life experiences. That's the law of science. I say, why is that important? Well, change your consciousness, and you change your life experiences. I go, ah! But that was 1927. Now I'll tell you something, a more recent article was published in Nature, which is the most prestigious scientific journal on the planet, from a physicist from the United States. The article is called The Mental Universe. I say, yeah, but what was the conclusion? I love it because I say, you don't read the article, just look at the last sentence. I say, what is the last sentence? And it says, the universe is immaterial meaning it's not made out of matter because now we know what is made out of matter is actually energy. Everything is energy. So it says the universe is immaterial. It's mental and spiritual live and enjoy. And I go, oh my God, the most prestigious scientific journal is giving us the solid information from physics, quantum physics, that we live in an energy universe. And that it's our mental thinking and our spiritual foundation that shapes the world that we're in. So all of a sudden it says, there's no accidents here, folks. Each of us is a creator. And now comes the issue I think that is most important for our audience, Oslam, and that is this. Your thoughts are creating your experiences. Yes. And uh, I go, well, then wait. I say, well, how's that working? Are you enjoying your life? Are you healthy? Are you happy? Are you living heaven on earth? I say, why? Well, those are thoughts. And if you have them, you should be living them. I say, but we're not living them. The world is filled with all kinds of crime and violence and struggle and anger and all kinds of stuff. I go, well, where's that coming from? Because each of us is supposed to be a creator. I'm not creating that. I'm in my head creating a, a beautiful world. And everyone would say that. But I then answer and I say, well, wait. If you're still having these beautiful thoughts, how come your life is not beautiful? How come if you're not living right now, truthfully, you can say to me, Bruce, I live a life of heaven on earth. If you can't say that, then there's something wrong with your creation. And I think if I should go on or not, Oslam, but I think yeah, this yeah, is why yeah, you asked actually, me to come here and say yeah, how to make that creation. Yes, yes, yes. I was going to ask that. But before I go there, I actually would like to just, um, I have a question around the quote of Einstein, where you said the field is the sole governing agency of matter or particle. Yes. And, you know, I heard a few years ago that uh, you know the field is actually creating what there is in matter it's not matter creating the field but the field is creating what's happening in our life and i heard about this um research done on women that uh, ultimately developed uterus cancer they had yeah. in their field this uterus cancer in their field they didn't have it have it in a visible world yet but because they had it in their field in the thoughts 
for example, it could be like my grandma had uterus cancer. So I might have an energy of, or I might get also uterus cancer because she has had it. And you go to the doctor and you just get some tests done and the test says you don't have anything. But in your head, in your thoughts, you still have, I might maybe have it or I might maybe get it. So would you say with these actually thoughts, we develop ultimately also illnesses for ourselves? <laughs> I would say about 100% right. Mm -hmm. And 100% right is based on this. For years, even in today's world of modern pharmaceuticals and conventional medicine, we always talk about if there's a problem in the body, there's something wrong with the genetics. Uh, and for example, they say, oh, cancer is due to a gene. Well, let me give you a fact of science, okay? Fact. There is not one gene that causes cancer. Cancer is not caused by a gene. Cause of cancer is not living in harmony with the world that you're in. And the disharmony leads to dis-ease. And in fact, less than 1% of all the disease on this planet is even connected to genetics and heredity. Said, so well, when you right. say yeah. disharmony leads to disease, how do we create disharmony that ah, ultimately okay. creates disease? Oh, you really want to get to the serious stuff. Yeah, okay. yeah, I really want to get to the serious stuff. <laughs> okay, let me go back just 60 years and then we'll start there, okay? 60 years ago, I was cloning cells. And you say, what does that mean? I say, a cloning is when you put just one cell in a Petri dish and it divides and it divides and then you get a petri dish filled with cells uh, and i said what's unique about it and i said well they all came from one parent so in a clone culture all of the cells that are in there could be thousands of cells they all came from one parent so they're all genetically the same that is the part of why cloning is an interesting thing now i have after a week of putting one cell in the petri dish a stem cell which is an embryonic cell they divide every 10 hours. The first is one, then there's two, four, eight, 16, doubling, doubling. At the end of the week, 30,000 cells in the Petri dish. I go, yeah, point. They're all genetically the same. They came from the same parent. I say, mm -hmm. cool. But I also have to tell you this. When we put cells in a Petri dish, they grow in a fluid, a liquid. I say, what do we call the fluid the cells grow in? I say, it's called culture medium. And I say that, what is culture medium? Now, wake up, folks. This is important. Culture medium is the laboratory version of blood. If I grow human cells, I say, what's human blood made out of? And then I take that chemistry and make culture medium and grow the cells in it. If I grow mouse cells, I say, what's mouse blood made out of? And make that culture medium grow those cells. So the chemistry of the culture medium is based on the chemistry of blood. Okay. Now, what do I have? I have a Petri dish with 30,000 cells in it, and I grow them in culture medium. So here's the experiment. I make three different versions of culture medium, slight chemistry different. They're, so they're all culture medium, but they're slightly different chemistry. So let's call them A, B, and C culture medium, okay? I take the 30,000 cells, and they're all genetically the same, and put them in... 10,000 cells into three dishes, okay? Mm -hmm. So all the dishes have genetically the same cells in them, okay? Now here, what do I do? I change the environment, the culture medium, the chemistry a little bit. So I have in culture medium A, the cells form muscle. In another dish with genetically the same cells but a different culture medium B, the cells form bone. And in the third Petri dish with the same genetically identical cells, but different culture medium, the cells form fat cells. The question is very profound and very important. It is, what made the cells bone, muscle, and fat? What, what was it that controlled the behavior of the cells? I say, they all had the same genes. So yes. I say, then what was different? The environment, the culture medium was different. And all of a sudden I say, Oh my God, we've been teaching people that genes turn on and off control life. And I go, false, 100% false. It's the environment that controls the genes. Change the environment and you change the genetic activity. That's what I did in the, in the experiment. So yes. you go, okay, that's cells in a Petri dish. I go, wait, wait, wait. 
when you look in the mirror and see yourself, you see one entity looking back. If you're Aslam, you see a beautiful woman looking back. That's her, one entity. I look in the mirror, I see me. I don't see Aslam. <laughs> I look and see that. Uh, but guess what? That shows you as a single thing. And I go, but if you had a microscope and you looked under your skin, you're, you'll find that you're made out of cells. A number so big it's 50 trillion cells. I go, oh, that sounds, oh, that sounds big. I say, you don't know how big it is. It's so big a number that you can, uh, trillions, 50 trillion. I'll give you an idea. If you wanted to count your cells, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, till 50 trillion, counting 24 hours a day, it would take 1,650,000 years to count the cells in your body. Wow. There are a lot of cells in there. And you, there are a lot. Use the word trillion, you don't, you, it's like a trillion is a thousand times, a thousand times a million. So it's like, that's a big number. So you got 50 trillion cells. So guess what? You are a skin covered Petri dish. Under your skin, you have 50 trillion cells in the skin dish. And I go, yeah, but you also have the original culture medium. What's that? Blood. That's what we make culture medium based on, your blood. So I say, you're a skin-covered Petri dish with the original culture medium blood. Now comes the important fact. Does it make a difference if the cell's in the plastic dish or if the cell's in the skin-covered dish in regard to the control? I say, nope. In both cases, it's controlled by the environment. In the culture dish, culture medium. In the skin-covered dish, blood. I say, so what's the point? It's the chemistry of the culture medium that controls the fate of the cells. And I go, oh, okay. And then I say, well, in the lab, I make the chemistry. I say, who or what controls the chemistry in your skin-covered Petri dish? The brain is the chemist. I go, oh, the brain puts the chemistry in and makes culture medium. I go, yeah. Now comes the biggest, most important question and answer, and that is this. What chemistry should the brain put into the blood? And here's the answer. Whatever picture you have in your mind, the brain translates the picture into complementary chemistry, chemistry that matches the picture. There's a chemistry, if you have love in your mind, there's a chemistry that goes into the blood that includes dopamine, which gives you pleasure. That's why falling in love, oh, it's pleasure. It's chemistry. It's chemistry. Also, when you fall in love, another chemical, oxytocin, mm -hmm. goes into your blood. But that bonds you to your lover. And here's one. Growth hormone is released into the blood when you have a picture of love in your mind. I go, so what? I say growth hormone gives you health and vitality. That's why when people fall in love, they're so healthy. Yes. They glow. Oh, look, they glow. See how healthy they are. Go, that's chemistry, folks. That's culture medium. Your blood is giving the chemistry of health and vitality. But I say, well, what if you have a picture of fear? Go, oh, <laughs> fear. You don't release love chemistry. You release fear chemistry. I go, that's completely different chemistry in the blood. I say, the culture medium is different. I say, what's different? Well, you put stress hormones in there. I go, oh, stress hormones. What does that do? I said, get you ready to save your life. Why? Fear means in the ancient days, and the modern version is still there, the saber-toothed tiger is coming. I said, what does that mean? Well, you've got to run like crazy. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not going to survive. So I say, well, growth is the body is maintaining itself. The body is taking care of itself. The immune system is working. The, everything, everything's healthy. But if fear picture comes in, you get ready to run. I go, well, wait a minute. I said, what does that mean? And here's an important fact about where the health crisis on the planet is coming from. Mm -hmm. It's the blood that carries the energy. Okay. The blood that carries the energy. Right. So if you want to make something work, you need to give it the blood. Okay. So now we're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger. What part of your body do you need the blood in? Arms, legs, run, go crazy, run. I say, oh, 
And when you're in a state of stress, the body wants the blood to go into the arms and legs so you can use that energy to save your life. I go, that's what happens. So now listen to three things here, Aslam, that make all the reason for the health problems on this planet. Over 90% what, of... What, the three reasons that make all the problems for the health in the, yeah. on the planet? Okay, yeah. please. I said less than 1% of disease is genes, so we're not going to count that 1%, okay? Mm -hmm. I say 99% of issues of health and disease, I said, where does that come from? Not from the genes. I said, where does it come from? I said, stress. stress. I said, well, how come? This is the reason, so you understand why stress is responsible for cancer, heart attacks, uh, um, Alzheimer's, things like that. I'll give you the answer. It's all the same answer. You ready? Yes. Let's go back to the story that 100,000 years ago, we're outside, we're picking berries, we're having a meal, everything is nice, and a tiger shows up. I said, now we got to run. So I say, yeah, so what's the body want to do? It says, well, stop growing now <laughs> and start getting ready to run. I said, well, how do you get to run? I said, you need the blood in the arms and legs. You need all the blood for the energy. And I go, yeah, the energy to run. So here's three things that happen when the stress hormones come into the body. Number one, it takes the blood vessels in the gut down here, all the organs, and squeezes them shut. And that makes the blood get pushed to the arms and legs. Okay? So I say, yeah, but what's the function of the gut? Maintenance of the body, fixing, cleaning, repairing, taking care of it, filtering the debris and all that. It takes care of you. It's cleaning the system and running. I say, but what happens when you're under stress? I say, uh-uh. The blood vessels get squeezed shut. That means there's no energy to take care of the body at this moment. I say, yeah, but where's the blood? I say, it got pushed to the arms and legs. That's the one I need to run away. So what go, happens oh. then to your gut and all the other organs? Well, the first thing is this. Guess what? You can even feel it. They, they call it sometimes butterflies in the stomach, or they call another word queasy. It feels like funny going on in your gut. And I say, mm -hmm. those feelings, you know what? That's the blood vessel squeezing shut with the stress hormones. You can feel it, okay? Yeah, so, I work part-time with kids. I teach at a primary school, and usually when kids come to you, they say, like, if there's something wrong, I have a tummy ache. I have a tummy ache. That's the first thing, not a headache, tummy ache. Yeah, because the, the, the fear is getting ready to run. And it's not in their awareness. It's just a feeling that something is wrong, and that's where the fear comes from. Something is wrong, okay? So the first thing is you shut off the growth, okay? Number two, and this is critical, the immune system uses a lot of energy. That protects you on the inside of your body. But if you're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger and you have an infection, how much you want to use the energy to fight the bacteria or you want to use the energy to run away from the tiger? The point is simply this. The immune system uses a lot of energy. If you've ever mm -hmm. been sick, sometimes you don't even have the energy to get out of the bed because the immune system uses that much. So I say, yeah. So now think about it. Here's a problem. You have a bacterial infection and you're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger. How, you want to, how much energy to fight the bacteria? How much energy to fight the, you know, to run away from the tiger? The answer, who cares about the bacteria? Because if the tiger catches you, bacteria, you don't got a problem anymore. <laughs> so, yes. so the idea is this. I don't need the immune system to work when I'm running away from the tiger. So stress hormones shut off the immune system. I go, you know, doctors use this. If they want to transplant, let's say, a heart from person A and put the heart into person B, if you put a foreign organ into your body, your immune system will say, not self, and eliminate that foreign organ. Well, the doctors don't want the patient to eliminate the heart transplant. So I say, what do they do? They say they don't want the immune system to work because if it works, it's going to eliminate the heart. So they give the person, before they do the transplant, they give them stress hormones. Why? It shuts off the immune system so that the heart won't be rejected. So I say, it's so good at shutting off the immune system, they use it to, yeah. in the transplant. So that's number two. One. Shut down the growth and maintenance of the body. Number mm -hmm. two, shut down the immune system. 
Number three, if you're running from a tiger, it's not time to think. Thinking is a very slow process. Like, you know, if I ask you to think of like today is Tuesday and I say, tell me what you're doing on Thursday, you can think and you can give me the answer, but it's going to take a little bit of time. <clears throat> Excuse me. But if you're running from the tiger, you don't I have don't give you time. Think. I just run. You run. And, and so now it's like reflexes. I say, oh, that's in the hindbrain back here. Reflex, subconscious. So I say, so what does the uh, stress hormones do? They Just like they squeeze the blood vessels in the gut, they squeeze the blood vessels in the thinking brain, and that mm -hmm. pushes the blood to the hind brain, which gets you ready for run. So I say, okay, three things that are the result of stress. One, shut down the growth and maintenance of the body. Two, shut down the immune system. Three, shut down the intelligence. Because, mm, shut, the because it's the... It pushes something from the front brain to the hind brain, the blood, which you said, right? The blood, which carries okay. the energy for the brain to work. But you sh shut off the blood to the thinking part because I can't, I don't want to use thinking. It's too slow. I want to go fast. Okay. So I say, okay, these three things shut down the growth and maintenance, shut down the immune system, shut down the intelligence. We're only designed to run away from a tiger, which I said, let's say 10 minutes. You shut it everything off. I shut it off 10 minutes. I'm free. I got away from the tiger. Then everything starts working again, okay? But in today's world, stress is not 10 minutes. Stress is all day. Yes. Stress is all week. Stress is all year. I go, oh. biology was not designed to stay in stress. It was supposed to stop the stress after a short period and then return the vitality, the health, the immune system, and return back to that. But in today's world, stress is way too much. The result is this. It's a cause of 90% or more of illness on this planet is just due to the stress. So people that are listening to this right now, you know, that, that maybe have a disease, you know, due to stress created, or maybe not have a disease, but experience a lot of stress. You know, I can tell yeah. you from my own experience, like, especially, you know, in a lot of, I, I stress with technology a lot, you know, then I get a WhatsApp, then I get an email, then I need to do that. Then I'm constantly on fight or flight mode. And yeah. when, when I meditate, I'm not, but then my day starts, I'm just starting slow. Oh, and then there's a point that triggers my stress and then I'm in stress almost all day until I'm on my bed. <laughs> right. What do you have to say to these people that are listening to this right now? Because I, I didn't know the growth immune system and intelligence, but I knew the immune system because I get bloated tummy. When I'm in yeah. stress, I can feel my tummy is getting bloated. But what do you have to say to these people that are experiencing stress or are having diseases caused by stress? <laughs> it's funny. There was a TV show, a, a comic, a comedian TV show years ago, and the ca the character, the actor was called Bob Newhart, and he played a psychologist or a psychiatrist. And people would come in and say, Doctor, I got all these problems, problems. And then he would just look at them, and every patient would come in, he would say the same thing. Just stop it. Stop it. <laughs> that was the same thing. As, no matter what the problem was. Uh, and it actually, it comes to that. That's actually true. The point is Just this. stop it. Just stop it. You have to change your thinking. Because let's explain. Go back to the skin-covered Petri dish. Mm -hmm. The thought in your head is a picture. The brain takes the picture, turns it into chemistry that matches the picture. So your body matches the thought. Are you having happy thoughts or thoughts of fear? I go, two different bodies. <laughs> Why? The chemistry is the culture medium, the blood, which controls the genetics and the behavior. So all of a sudden it says your thoughts are creating the problem. And I go, well, yeah, but what do you do about these thoughts? Well, number one is this. Recognize this. There are thoughts that you can do something about and try to fix a problem. And there are thoughts where you have no ability to do anything, but you just have the thought, like world peace. Oh, yeah, the world's in war. world is crazy. This is negative. Oh, my God, I'm afraid. I go, look, you have no control over that. So thinking about that, does that help the war or did it make it better? I go, no, but it made you sick. It didn't change them. And all of a sudden I say, number one, 
if you want to be concerned about your fears, then be concerned about the ones you have something you can do about. But if you start buying the fear because the world around you is crazy, I go, you can't change the world around you. So if you keep thinking about it, then you're going to take the picture of the world around you, put it in your head and make the picture into your body. So there are things, the first thing is this, uh, I call it an energy checkbook. I go, wait Energy say, checkbook. Yeah. I say, you have a checkbook. And I say, what does it represent? I say, I have money in the bank and I could write the check. Okay. I go, money is energy. If you have money, you can do something. You have no money. You can't do something. Money is energy. And I say, you have a checkbook. I say, you don't write checks that give away your money. You, you write checks for things that come back to you, something you can use or something your family or community can use. Then you put your energy into it. But you don't just write a check and say, oh, hey, I like your shoes. I'm going to give you five bucks because you got some nice shoes. You know, you don't do stupid things. I go, oh, you're very careful with the energy in your bank account because that's your life. I go, oh, yes, it is. And guess what? The energy in your body is life. Life is energy. If you waste your energy, you are reducing the quality and character of your life. You're going to go poor. And when your energy poor, that's when you get sick. Okay. So the idea is this. Then use your energy where it can have some usefulness and don't use it where you can't change something. People get crazy about politics and they get an anger and they, they yell and everybody's yelling and everybody getting red and everything. I go, that's energy. <laughs> I, and then after the argument, I say, did you change the world? No. I said, but you just used all that energy. I go, you wasted that. Yeah. Might as well go to your bank account, write a check and give it away. And all of a sudden it says, then think about it. Before you write a check, energy check, not the money one, which is the same thinking. Are you getting value for your energy? Basically, say like this. Uh, you, you put your energy into things you can change that are important to you and to your family and your community. But you do not put your energy into a system where nothing is going to come back and you're just going to lose the energy. You could say, I'm going to go out there and, and you know yell at the politician. I say, is that going to change it? I say, if it doesn't change it, then you just use all your energy and you didn't get anything back. You didn't even enjoy life. That was no joy in doing that. Your energy, you can make war or energy, you can make love. I said, well, which way do you want to use your energy? That's a choice. Just stop it. <laughs> Just stop it and choose actually deliberately where to spend your energy on. I actually, I, I love what you just said, you know, uh, and I want to give an example of a friend of mine, which is pregnant and she, she works for a big corporate company and she uh, also uh, experienced a lot of stress and she didn't want to work there. But when she was, she's still pregnant uh, two weeks ago, she told me like, I resigned. And, you know, we live in the Netherlands. I don't know how it is in the United States, but when you, you can get a maternity leave and you can still get a salary. And I said to her, why did you resign? And I said, why do you mean you can just still wait till you just, you know, finish, you know, when you are going to maternity leave. And she said, you know what? It gave me so much stress. It's a waste of my energy to stay there. Because I am pregnant, I don't want to give that energy to me and to my baby. And I was like, I just, I admire this decision so, so much. Because she chose deliberately where to put her energy in. I that, ask a, It's an important story mm -hmm. because I want people to understand what just happened there. Uh, and the energy story is this, the energy is in the blood. And she is 100% right. Uh, the story of how the chemistry of the blood controls the genetics is the new science called epigenetics. That's the new science. The old science is just genetics. I go, what does that mean? I say, well, let's say uh, I have uh, cancer because genes cause cancer. And I go, no, they don't. <laughs> I say, epigenetics causes cancer. And you go, what's that? And I go, epi means above. I say, well, what do we call skin? epidermis. I say, why? Because just underneath the skin at the top is a layer called the dermis. And the skin is above the dermis. So epi means above. Epidermis. Now I say this disease is caused epigenetically. And I say, what does that mean? Epi above 
genes, epigenetic, above the genes. I go, oh, the control is not in the genes. I go, no, that's where we made a mistake. Genes are blueprints to make the proteins which make our body. And I say, why do we need blueprints? I say, proteins are very complex molecules and they're wearing out all the time. They wear out like parts in a machine. You got to replace them. I say, they're very complex. I say, how do you know how to make a protein? I say, the DNA is the instruction. It's a blueprint. Okay, it's a blueprint to make a protein. I said, that's what a gene is. And I go, so what? And I say, go into an architect's office and let's say she's working on a blueprint and you look at her and you ask her, is your blueprint on or off? And she would look at you like, what are you, crazy? There's no on and off to a blueprint. I go, yes, that's true. Point. A gene is a blueprint. It has no on and off. Your whole life you've been told, genes turn on, genes turn off. That made you a victim. Why? You didn't control them. They controlled you. Victim. Genetics. I go, that's the old belief. I go, wrong. 100% wrong. Genes cannot turn on and off. Genes are blueprints. Then I say, well, how does it work? I say, you need the architect. It's the architect that reads the blueprints. I go, what's the architect? Yeah. Epigenetic, above the genes, is the mind. The mind creates a picture. The brain translates that picture into chemistry that matches the picture. The chemistry goes into the blood and goes to the cells and adjusts the genes to make the picture real. Is it a picture of love or a picture of fear? I got two different buildings. <laughs> two, they're not the same thing. But I wanted to emphasize this because she's carrying a baby. And I say, so what? I say, the baby is like cells in a Petri dish. I said, where's the culture medium coming from to feed the baby? I say, the mother's blood is the culture medium. I go, so why is that important? I say, the mother's blood has more than nutrition. It has information. The information that controls the genes of the baby. So in the old days when I was teaching in medical school, we say, what, is, what does the mother have to do to be a good mother? Oh, she has to exercise, she has to eat well, she has to take vitamins and supplements, and that was it. I said, is that all a movement had to be, to be a good mother? And I say, in those days, we believed that the genes turned on and off and controlled the development of the child, so that the mother just had to give the nourishment and the child's genes would control the baby. Uh-uh, wrong, 100%, old story. New story, epigenetics. It's the culture medium that controls the genes. Then I go, so what? The mother's blood is her culture medium that organizes her life to her world. But she sends the same blood to the fetus. So I guess what? The fetus is getting the information that the mother's feeling and experiencing. The yes. fetus gets it. If the mother is in stress, the fetus is in stress. If the mother is happy, the fetus is happy. And all of a sudden, she did the right move. Why? The stress of the job was making the chemistry she was sending to her future baby, the fetus, have chemistry in it that was stress chemistry. That's not yeah. going to help baby at all. That will actually make the genetic activity of that baby worse. It'll be born with less activity. In fact, here's a, a number... And this is from a scientific study, so I want you to get the number. The blood from the mother that nourishes the baby determines the intelligence of the baby by how much the brain grows. How much does the brain grow? How much blood does it get? Ah, that's the same story. I go, so why is this important? If a mother is stressed out, what happens to the brain, the blood vessels in the brain up here where the thinking part is? They squeeze shut. So that means if the mother's under stress, the fetus's brain is not getting the energy to develop because the blood is going to the arms and legs. Make a street fighter out of that baby. Can give it strong arms and legs. But it cuts the intelligence of the child the more stress she's under. And mm -hmm. here's the number I wanted to tell you. 50% of the child's intelligence can be lost if the mother is in stress during the pregnancy period. 50%. 50% of the intelligence the... of the child. Cut the intelligence child in half. Why? 
Because if she's in stress, then the fetus's body is going to get into the stress thing. It's going to have a strong body because stress means it's going to have to fight a lot. Remember I said the blood in the front is squeezed shut, but it goes to the hindbrain where reflexes are? Well, the hindbrain of that child is going to be really big and fast. Why? Because it's going to control all those muscles. And the intelligence <laughs> going away. And I said, well, what are you making? A street fighter, a soldier. That's the result of a fetus that's growing up in stress hormones. Not mm. smart, but strong and fast. Interesting, Why? interesting. Survival is based on being strong and fast. And all of a sudden I said, so the mother is not just nourishing the baby. The mother is giving the baby a head start. What's happening in her world? Because that baby's going to be born into this world. So if the mother's responding to the world, then the baby's going to get the same chemistry to adjust its body to deal with the same thing the mother is dealing with. Bruce, and then when the, once the child is born, because I want to go actually for a moment to the mind, our minds, the subconscious oh, and the conscious mind. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes. We talked actually about amazing, amazing stuff. And I actually would like to go so further, but I am conscious about your time. Uh, I am conscious about your time. And maybe my subconscious, I also think like, hey, I need to be on time. I need to make sure he's on time. So what are the two minds? Okay. And how is our minds programmed? Yes. Okay. When we say the mind, that's, that's wrong because there are two minds. They work together. One is called the conscious mind. That's the one connected to your spirit, your personal identity. That's you, conscious mind, creative mind. The other mind, bigger, is called the subconscious mind. I go, what's that? And I said, that got programs in it. It's got habits. So the conscious mind is creative. The subconscious mind got habits. Okay. Well, habits are programs. I say, oh. So I said, guess what? We used to think the subconscious mind evil. I go, no. Subconscious mind's a hard drive in the computer. The brain is a computer. Really? And the subconscious mind is a hard drive. Got programs in it. In the old days, when you buy a computer, it didn't come with a program. So let's go back to the old days. I just bought a brand new computer. I plug it in. I push start. The screen lights up. It's called boot it up. I say, do something. You say, I can't. I say, you got a brand new computer. What do you mean you can't do something? You say, first I have to put the programs in. Then I can use a computer. I go, oh. So we download like Word or surf the web, you know, Google and all that. Excel, now yeah. you can use the computer. A child's computer brain, the screen lights up three months before birth, mm. and it's ready to go, but it's got no programs. So the first programming comes from what? Whatever signals the mother is sending to the blood is controlling behavior, and if the mother has a pattern where she repeats something, that's how the fetus learns, from the pattern of the chemistry, okay? So a fetus learns even before it's born from how the mother's experiencing life, okay? Uh, I, I got to emphasize, it's very important because I didn't mention the father. <laughs> but here's the important part about the father. The father's role is to support the mother. Mm. If the mother is not supported, then the child is not supported. So the father has a big job. <laughs> you take care of that woman and you make sure she has a happy thing going because she's growing the child that will use her consciousness <laughs> to adjust its genetics. So... You want her to be in a good place. So fathers have an important role of support. That's what it's all about. Okay. So now the brain is kicked in. Some programming starts before it's born. But for the next seven years, the child's brain is not fully developed. It's not expressing what we call consciousness, like what we're talking right now and we're communicating with conscious and all that. A child's brain under seven is not in conscious. It's at a lower vibration called theta. Theta is hypnosis. I go, so why is that? Well, theta is also imagination. Yeah, the child in theta expresses the real world mixed with the imaginary world. I always love a famous tea party. You pour nothing into the cup. You drink nothing. And you say, that was the best tea I ever had in my life. I yes. go, that's theta, imagination. 
But theta is also hypnosis. And I say, why, why should it be in hypnosis? And here's the answer. How many rules do you think you have to know to be a functional member of a family? How many rules do you have to know to be a functional member of the community? There are things you can do and there are things you can't do. You got to learn these things, you know? You're not an adult and then you have to go to the bathroom and you take your pants off and go to the bathroom in the middle of the room with everybody. No, you had to learn there were rules how to do that. Yes. And so I say, well, when do you get the rules? Because there's thousands of them. I say, a child under seven can't go to school, uh, can't read. It's not ready for classroom. I say, but it's got to know the rules. So I say, ah, nature made the first seven years in theta, which is hypnosis. So the first seven years of your life, you get programs. And I say, they're not bad programs, all of them. Some of them are really good and important programs. Like, when did you learn how to walk? Before you were two? Are you still walking? Yeah, guess what? You learned program subconscious. You don't have to think about it. Nope, you could just walk by thinking. I'm going to go over there. You don't even have to say, I'm going to walk. You just say, I'm going over there. And the system will play the program of walking automatically. Driving the car. If you've been driving the car for a long time, you don't think of the details of driving the car. You did when you first learned. But now you go, I'm going to the store. You put the key in the car. You started. You're not thinking about all the things you used to think about when you first got into the car. Why? Because driving is our program. Okay? So I say, oh, we get good programs on how to live our life and how to live in health and harmony and love and all that. We get those programs. But we also get a lot of bad programs. Yeah, <laughs> maybe even more than the good ones. Actually, 60% of the programs are disempowering, self-sabotaging, and limiting beliefs. 60%. So you're right. We have more negative programs than we have positive programs. I go, yeah, but you say, well... I don't need to use a program because my conscious mind, age seven, is kicked in. Now I can be creative. So it's like a computer. The hard drive's got the programs, but the conscious of the mind is the one that types on the keys and puts in what you want. Your conscious mind's creator. Type it what you want. I want a wonderful life, healthy, happy, love. Well, you can do what you want. So I go, <clears throat> so the conscious mind is creative and can put in the information and go where it wants to go. But here is the problem, and this is why you brought it up. The conscious mind not only can look out your eyes. For a moment, just pretend your body's like a car, and you're the driver, and you have your eyes open, you're looking out the window, and guess where you're driving? When the conscious mind is in charge, it's driving you to what? Wishes and desires. That's conscious mind. Love, happiness, joy, relationships, whatever. You're driving with conscious mind, looking out the window. <coughs> Excuse me. But here's the problem. The conscious mind can also think. They go, what does that mean? I go, thinking is not looking out. Thinking is looking in. As I said, today's Tuesday. I can ask any one of you, what are you doing on Thursday? Now, it may not be written in your anywhere right there. It may not. <clears throat> but in a short moment of thinking, you'll say, oh, on Thursday, I'm going to do this and this. And I said, where'd you get the information? I thought. I said, oh, when you were thinking, guess what? You were looking inside. You weren't looking out. I go, what, what if you're driving the car? Really? What if you're driving the car and you start thinking? I say, then you're not looking out the windshield because thinking is on the inside. And I say, oh, who's driving the car? And I go, don't worry. The subconscious program that you learned how to drive, it's going to drive the car. And the subconscious is a million times more powerful a computer. So actually, if the car is going out of control, the thinking mind is shut off and the subconscious program takes over because it's fast. Okay. So here's the point. When you are thinking, you're not looking out at the world. You're inside thought. I say, yeah, but let's say you were walking, talking, driving, things you know how to do. I go, oh, those are habits. I go, oh. The moment you are thinking, the subconscious mind is autopilot. It takes over the things you're not paying attention to. It knows how to do everything because it's a habit. <coughs> Excuse me. So, I say, so when your conscious mind is thinking, the creative mind is not running the show. I go, nope. When it's thinking, it's inside. The show is now run by the subconscious program. I go, so what? I go, 
Well, guess what? Thinking is 95% of the day. I go, so what does that mean? I go, well, then you're not living your life with your wishes and desires, creative, conscious mind. It is only working 5%. I said, then where's your life coming from? I said, from the programs. I go, 95% of your life is from the programs. And as we just brought up and you brought it up, I said, 60% of those are negative. Exactly. Exactly. So are you also then saying like, you know, the financial situation or the situation in our relationships or family, friends, jobs, everything, what we are actually experiencing right now is actually uh, based on our subconscious program, the program from zero to Nine, seven years 95%. old, 95%. 95%. Now, now here comes the part, and this is where all the trouble comes from right here. And this is it. If you're thinking, you're looking inside, you're not looking outside. I go, so what? I said, but your program is playing outside. I said, but you don't see your own program. I go, no, why not? You're thinking, so the program is automatic. I say, you're making behavior, you don't even see it. I go, no, you don't. Why? Thinking is inside. So I go, but what if you start playing negative program? I go, then you're going to create a negative experience. <laughs> I say, well, you know you did it? I go, nope. You know why? You didn't even see your thoughts turn into reality because you were inside thinking. You are not paying attention. So 95% of your life is coming from a program and you're the one that doesn't even see the program. So I've been telling a story for 40 years. You have a friend. You know your friend's behavior very well. And you know your friend's parent. One day you see your friend has the same behavior as the parent. So you want to tell your friend, you go, hey, Bill, you're just like your dad. Back away from Bill. I say, why? Because I can tell you what Bill's response was, and you've already experienced it anyway. The first thing Bill's going to say is, how can you compare me to my dad? I'm nothing like my dad. I go, what does that mean? I said, he doesn't see when he's like his dad. I said, who sees... Who sees him when he's like his dad? I said, everybody else. <laughs> and I said, how much of the day? I said, 95% of the day. He got a negative program from his dad. He's playing a negative program 95% of the day. Does Bill see it? Nope, because you say, Bill, you're just like your dad. And he says, no, I'm not. I go, why? Because he doesn't see his own behavior 95% of the day. Now comes, now it comes, you ready? Yes, I want to Bill. be ready. We are all Bill. Every one of us is doing this every yes. day. Yes. You think I'm creating life with wishes and desires. I want to be healthy. I want a great romance. I want to have a great job. And I go, those are wishes and desires. Conscious mind, I go 5%. 95% is coming from that program you got from other people. How do are we change? What's that? How do we change? Oh, is that, oh, a little subject like that. Oh, a little thing. Like, <laughs> I could give you an idea. I said, You can only change the program you learn the way you learned the program. I said, what does that mean? I said, well, how'd you learn the first seven years? I said, your brain wasn't even functioning up of consciousness. It was below conscious. So it's called theta. That's called hypnosis. I said, yeah, you can rewrite the program with hypnosis. And then you say, do I have to see a hypnotherapist? I go, no, cool. Why? At the lowest vibration in your brain is called delta, sleep, unconscious fully, okay? The next higher vibration is theta, imagination, okay, and hypnosis. The next higher vibration picked up at age seven is called alpha, which is calm consciousness, thinking, okay? And then by age 12, it even gets a higher vibration called beta, which is like going to school or work thinking, very complex. So I say, so as an adult, you're at work and you're at the high vibration, beta, and then you come home and relax. Then it calms down. That's called alpha, calm consciousness. But the moment you fall asleep, you're in your bed, you're awake for a moment, then boom, you're not there. You went from alpha, you shut it off, no more thinking, you're not conscious, but the next vibration down is called theta. So while you went to sleep with your conscious mind, there's a period just after you fall asleep, a short period where the brain subconscious is listening because it's in theta which is hypnosis so if you put earbuds in or earphones on and you play a program through the through those ways of hearing 
that are programs that help you live a better life, healthy life, loving life, better job. They're, they're called self-help programs. You can buy them at bookstores. I say you put that program on as you're going to bed. And you might hear some of it as, well, you're still awake. But the moment you fall asleep, guess what? You don't hear the words anymore. But your subconscious does because it's in hypnosis and theta. Mm. So whatever is coming in through the speakers is going in through hypnosis. You would just repeat the program, repeat the program, and guess what? You downloaded a new program. And oh, what'd wow. You what'd you do? You went to sleep. Hey, I said, that's a lot of work. Why? You fall asleep, the program will take care of itself. You put the earphones on. Okay. That's called self-hypnosis. Okay. Yep. Theta hypnosis is how you created the programs for seven years. But after age seven, you're not in theta. Now you're in conscious level. I say, yeah, but you still learn things in the program. I say, you learn how to drive a car. Okay. You learn how to play a music instrument. You learn how to do a job. I say, how'd you do that? I said, practice, repetition. You want to drive the car? Practice driving the car. You want to do a new kind of um, effort? Practice it. Why? Practice makes habits. The first seven years, hypnosis made habits. But after age seven, you created new programs based on your life experiences. And then by practicing and repeating them, you turn them into habits. So you want to make a new life? Practice a new life. They have an old, uh, old saying, not that old, actually a new age saying, which I always laugh at because it says, fake it till, till you, you make, make it. Make it. <laughs> and what's the point? You're not a happy person and you want to be a happy person. So what do you do? I say then all day long, repetition. That was the point. You repeat to yourself, I am happy. I am happy. As many times a day you can remember, you just say to yourself, I am happy. I say, what are you doing? Making a habit. What's a habit? Repetition. And after doing this for a number of days, you won't have to say it anymore because by repetition, you will be happy because you repeated it as a habit. Yes. Okay. I, I have done that with few affirmations. The one of them was everything works always uh, works always out for me. For I yep. think I did it for many years, but now I don't repeat it anymore. But I know everything works always out for me. I don't know how, but it works always out for me. Well, because it's a program and it's playing 95% of the day. It's creating your life. Uh, and let me just emphasize again from physics, quantum physics, the most truthful, valid science. Okay. Consciousness is creating your life experience. You change your consciousness, whether it's through uh, uh, self-hypnosis, whether it's through repetition, and you have automatically changed the character of your life. You'll change your genetics and everything when you when you uh change that thinking process is that know? is that is that also the same with when you are when you have a disease like w when you have a disease would you also recommend that someone is doing self-hypnosis and repeating the feelings of i'm healthy i'm healthy yeah. i'm let healthy me just, let me just the important part of the reprogramming and this listen up people any reprogramming you have to do as if you already have what you want not that you will get it Like, I will be healthy. I will fall in love. I say, no, don't do that. Because I say, make a recording. Okay, today I record, I will be healthy. And then I say, let's come back next year and see what the program says. Next year, you're, I will be healthy. I say, you, all year long, you talk about you will be healthy. You never said I am healthy. So you, you never got healthy. Why? Because you never said I am. You have to put into the programming what you want to be true is if it already is true i am healthy it's not i will be i am healthy i am lovable i am this i am that you don't ever write i will or shall or whatever future because then you're, you're not programming now <laughs> programming now and you might be sick as a dog you could be sick right now you could be dying of cancer i say you can change that cancer By what? You have to change your belief system about the cancer. You have to change it. I am healthy. And you have to start recognizing that your programming has made you unhealthy. Hmm. And, uh, and, and it also, in many cases, has made you a victim. I say, what do you mean? I say, we got programmed for seven years of life. If you came from a regular family, 
When somebody in the family was sick, where did they take that person? They took them to the doctor. I said, in the first seven years, every time you were sick, every time somebody in the family was sick, we went to the doctor. I said, what's the program? You were practiced it. You, were, you went to the doctor and you went to the doctor and you went to the doctor. And I said, so what's the program? If I am sick, the doctor fixes me. I go, so why is that important? Because you give up power over your health because you say, I don't know anything about my health. The doctor knows about my health. And I say, so why is that important? Because then whatever the doctor says is part of the program. Yeah. The doctor says you have three months left to live. You're going to die in about three months. Because why? He's the programmer. Because you said, I won't take my words. I'll take the doctor's words. Because who am I? I don't know things, right? So basically... What the point is simply this is, is that we have given up power over our health in the conventional world because we have given the power to, ter to tell us about our health to a doctor. If the doctor says you're going to be healthy, fine, then you're going to get to be healthy. But if the doctor says your hair is going to fall out, you're going to get sick, and then you're going to die, well, get ready. Because if you listen to that and believe the doctor, that becomes your program. Okay? Yeah. And your program was downloaded. Downloaded from what? Repetition. We went to the doctor. We went to the doctor. We went to the doctor. I said, what's the result? The doctor takes care of me. I go, well, then what about you? You go, I'm, I don't know, just whatever the doctor said. And I go, well, then you don't have any power. So we have to take that back. And we have to recognize we can change the, I say you can change the program. But first, let me emphasize this really important. You were programmed before you were born. You were programmed a whole year from zero to one. What, what program did you get when you were zero? Well, I don't know. Okay, you were programmed a whole year from one to two. What program did you get when you were one? Well, I don't know. Okay, you were programmed a whole year from two to three. Hey, what program did you get when you were two? Well, I don't know. Why? You weren't conscious? So now I tell you your program is running your life. And then I tell you 95% of your life is a program. You know what that means? Your life is a printout of your program point. Look at your life right now and recognize the truth. The things you like that come into your life, you have programs to support them. That's why they're there. But listen to this one. The things that you want, that you desire, that you wish for, and you struggle, you work hard, you sweat over it. I'm putting a lot of effort in. I'm going to make it. I'm making it happen. I'm working real hard. Why are you working so hard? Answer. You ready? Whatever that destination is you wanted to get to, that early program does not support it. So what and do you recommend you... to people that are experiencing like that? Like, for example, I, I grew up really like striving, 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 and go, go, you need to get this so many times and go, 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 a lot of stress. And I'm kind of letting it go, but I'm on the other side, I'm also scared to let it go because... That was the program, right? So when people are recognizing right now their subconscious programs, which are not serving them, what is the first step there, there to are do? Three ways, and three ways, and I already said two. You could put the earphones or earbuds on at night and listen to a self-help program and repeat that, and then it will automatically program while you're sleeping. Or how'd you get a program after you were seven? You repeated something and you repeated the behavior and you practiced. The more you practiced, the more it became a habit. You don't like the way you're living right now, then practice another way and practice it and practice it because it will become a habit and replace the bad habits. Okay. And there's a third way, which is to me the most important way in this world today, which is crazy. It's called energy psychology. It's a new version of psychology. It doesn't go over your history. I don't care what your history is. I don't care who did what to who. You know why? You walked away with the program. The program is what is playing today. Those people that created the program with you, they're not here anymore. What do you want to change as a program? I said, what's the program? I just told you. Look at your life. <laughs> And I said, well, what do you want to change? Well, I want more love. I want health. I want a better job. I go, oh, well... Now you want to make a program out of that? And I go, yeah. Energy psychology is a way of downloading programs in a very rapid, rapid way. The, the first two, hypnosis and uh, uh, practice, habituation, they take longer time. 
on my website, and I need the people to get this right away. It's simple. BruceLipton.com. BruceLipton.com. Under resources, there are 25 or more energy psychology practices, different modalities. Each one comes with a paragraph to describe how that practice works and a website so you can get to the source of that practice, okay? Does energy psychology work? You bet your life it does, and it can work in some cases uh, in 10 or 15 minutes, walk away with a different life because it's a new way of programming. It's a super learning way of programming. I go, what's super learning? I'd say, a child under seven only has to experience something once and it'll remember it for the rest of its life. Yeah. I say, why? Because a child under seven, the brain is working in what's called whole brain super learning. What is whole brain? I go, well, you got a left side and a right side with a line down the middle. And we call them hemispheres. The left side is more intellectual. It's got all the words. The right side is more emotional. It's got all the pictures. I say, when you were under seven, they worked together. Every experience had a a uh, meaning with words and every experience had an emotion connected to it. So you learned everything with both meaning and emotion. After age seven, they don't physically separate, they functionally separate. So at our age today, after age seven, you're not in whole brain. That sometimes it's like a wave. Sometimes during the day, you're more in the intellectual side where words are more important. And then a few hours later, you're in the other side where emotions are more important. And then it goes back to words. It's a wave. Left side, right side, left side, right side. Okay. But if you want to learn how to put a program in real fast, I say, oh, then you want the left side and right side to come back together again. I go, this is a process that engages the super learning that a child has. And using this process to reprogram it only takes sometimes minutes and you can change a program you had your whole life and change it in a matter of minutes. So energy psychology on brucelipton.com. Brucelipton.com. And, and there's so yeah. many different versions. And uh, yeah. I mean, I'm biased because uh, I changed my whole life, uh, even with two, two what they call balances. Well, it was called psychk, P-S-Y-C-H hyphen K.com. P-S-Y-C-H hyphen k.com and we'll, we'll put it in episode notes it's, yeah please do because it's one of the I change of belief in 10 15 minutes walk away different person i go yeah you know in your conversation with lewis house you were telling him like you know earlier years ago you just experienced like uh, a lot of happiness in your life you know for a, for a period of time and then you know something happened that you just uh, had negative uh, energy, negative thoughts, yeah. and then you just was in a turmoil of this circle of negativity, and then you went back again to being very happy. And yeah. somehow you did something that you got out of this vicious circle. How did you do that? <laughs> yeah. What was happening exactly there? It was funny because I mentioned the comedian Bob Newhart that said, just stop it. Uh, I will never forget. It was a very bad day in the laboratory. To set up an experiment, it takes over two hours to prepare everything for the experiment. And if you screw it up, it's wasted. You got to do it again. This day, I was in the. I did it three different times, which took a whole day to set up these experiments, and it failed the first time, second, third time, and and I was looking at the fourth time. I said, "No, I, I just got mad at myself." And I said, "You, you know, talk to myself." you idiot, you can't do anything right, you're so stupid, blah, blah, blah. And I'm giving myself the depression talk because if I start this depression talk, it doesn't stop. It sometimes just goes worse and worse and never gets better for a while. So I'm alone in the laboratory and I'm going, oh, you know, yelling at myself for being so stupid. And then I hear a voice and there's only me and I'm the only one in the room. And I hear a voice and the voice says, don't you have anything better to do than to listen to this stuff? And I stopped and I just, I heard that voice. It surprised me. There was nobody there and I heard it clear. And I, I said, yeah, I'd rather go see a movie than to listen to this stuff. So what did I do? I picked up a newspaper, found a movie, went to the movie, had a good time, came out of the movie. And guess what? No more depression. No more anger at myself. I moved on to something else. I did the Bob Newhart thing. Stop it. What did I do? Go do something else. Go do something you want. If you catch yourself in a negative cycle, 
frequently it gets worse and worse and worse and it gets very, very negative. Okay. And now I know the answer. And, uh, and because the next time I started to do negative, I started to laugh because I remembered the voice and the voice said, go do something else. I said, sure, go do something else. Every time I did something else, guess what? The voice stopped where I was stopped. And I was back into doing something I wanted to do instead of following the program down and down and down. And it's exactly what, uh, as I said, Bob Newhart, just stop it. But just I happen to it. hear a voice <laughs> that asked me that question it says, don't you have anything better to do? Of course, there are many different things I could do. So I picked one and the depression was over. So you actually practice stopping it, stopping it, stopping it, stopping it, stopping and you didn't need to practice anymore because it was well, stopped. Because actually it only took about three times <laughs> that I started to laugh and go, oh, yeah, just do something else. And about, uh, it's been 20 some years. I wow. have no more negative thinking. Why? Because the learning says, if you start going this way, the brain immediately switches and says, go do something else. And guess what? Same, same Bruce, different life. Why? I'm not responding to those things anymore. I created a habit that said, if you start doing this, go do something else. And I repeated that, even not that many times, three times maybe. Yeah. And my mind said, yep, okay. Because anytime I started to get depressed, my mind said, hey, mm -hmm. go do something else. And boom, end of depression. So my last question, Bruce, is if you could give one advice to parents that are having kids between the zero and seven, and maybe also, you know, older, but especially the zero, seven age, when you yeah. program your subconscious mind, what would that be? One I advice. I would give them every positive thing you can think of, how smart they are, how beautiful they are, how powerful they are, how they're great creators, how they can do anything. Why? Because if they become the subconscious programs and that child runs 95% of its life from what? The super positive program. I'm smart. I'm intelligent. I'm powerful. I'm a creator. I can create what I want. I said, then guess what? Their life will be an expression of all the positive things you said. The problem with it is most parents are like a coach on a sports team. If a player isn't doing well on a sports team, the coach doesn't go, oh, please do better. No, the coach goes, that's not good enough. What do you think you are? You don't deserve to be on this team. And that player who's older is thinking, going, oh, I'm not doing, I'm not working as hard. I could do better. I can, I can do better. I go, that's the thinking when a parent yells at a child under seven, that if I yell them, you don't deserve it, then you'll be thinking, okay, I'll do something better. I go, problem. The child under seven is not thinking, it's just recording. Whatever you just said is recording. Not good enough, that's a behavior. Not Just be enough, conscious. Be conscious about what you put in that recorder, parents. Right. So, so parenting, you're... conscious parenting. Conscious, it's called conscious parenting. When you speak to a, a child, and it's even the baby you're holding in your arms, it's not, it doesn't say any words or anything. It's recording. The words come later. So if you're holding a baby, don't talk anything negative about this baby because it's being recorded while you're saying that. Never say negative things around the child under seven because they're downloading and you're going to record what it said. A child under seven is not the player on a sports team. They're not thinking, they're recording. So if you say not good enough, then the child downloads, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not lovable. And you didn't mean for the child to have that for their life, but you didn't know if that child's under seven, those words are now a program that will play with that child's life and control it 95% of the time. So conclusion is simple. Only give your child the highest, best comments. You're the most lovable. You're the most powerful. You're the most wonderful. You're going to fix the world. You're going to help the world. You're... I say, just say these things. Why? They're being recorded. And then 95% of that life is going to come from those recordings. So feed them the positive one because that's the one that will change the life of that child. So, Bruce, this has been so, so amazing. Thank you very, very much. I want to mention to the listener and the watcher your website again, brucelipton.com. You have a YouTube channel, Bruce Lipton. You're on Instagram, Bruce Lipton. And please make sure that you check the uh, energy psychology, what you mentioned yes. on brucelipton.com website. So 
Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart, Bruce. I cannot explain to you how much this means to me. Thank you. Thank you. Just thank you. I, I so appreciate it. And again, I really appreciate our audience because if you start creating a life this way, the world will change overnight. Your world will change first and enough of us do it, the whole world will change with it. So thank you for being with us. And these words are really uh, powerful words if you understand how to use them to create the beautiful life you desire. And I want to thank you for this opportunity to talk to that community. And so thank you, Auslan. Thank you very much. <laughs>